Dealing with depression, anxiety, and addiction can be overwhelming. Mental health issues affect children and adults and people of all races and backgrounds. If you're struggling, you are not alone. What was once a rising problem has turned into a national crisis, but we want you to know there is help. Finding Hope, managing the mental health crisis town hall begins now. Thank you to the Eunice Joyce Gardner Charitable Foundation for its leadership support of the Health Channel. Welcome to Finding Hope, Managing the Mental Health Crisis. We're going to be shining the light on some of the mental health challenges that are so common today and highlighting ways to find help, hope, and a path forward. We have such a great panel for you today. Dr. Eden Evans, founder and director of the Massachusetts General Hospital Center for Addiction Medicine and professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Jeffrey Bornstein, host of the PBS series, Healthy Minds with Dr. Jeffrey Bornstein. He's also president and CEO of the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. Welcome. Dr. Tina Carroll Scott, pediatrician and medical director of the South Miami Children's Clinic, and Dr. Marisa Azaret, clinical director of the Department of Psychology at Nicholas Children's Hospital. I wanna thank you all for joining me tonight. Great to be here. Thank you Great for having us. Here. Pleasure. So grateful for your time. We also want to hear from you. If you have questions for our experts, please send it via email at questions at allhealthtv.com. That's questions at allhealthtv.com. We're going to get to as many as we can throughout this amazing hour. Now, all of you know firsthand the severity of the mental health crisis we are facing. It is a crisis. I'd like to get your take on what should be our highest priorities. Dr. Azaret, let me start with you. Thank you for having me here, Olga. And you're asking a very important question, it's so difficult to answer. But I think we need to uh, address the issue from different perspectives. And one of them, obviously, is supporting those patients that have mental illness, that have to be living with mental illness. And then support those that are uh, a high risk for developing mental illness. And then the general population in terms of educating, prevention. So we have to address the issue if you ask me one particular issue from my standpoint as a, as a pediatric specialist, it would be the parenting, the parents, the kids, the teenagers that are going through a crisis that I have never seen before in mm -hmm. 37 years that I have been practicing. But like you mentioned, is different angles that need to be addressed. And we're gonna talk a lot about those angles in this hour. Dr. Borenstein, your thoughts, please. I think the, the key is making sure that people who need help get help, that there's access to care, and that people know that with help, they can get better. Um, the good news here is, and Finding Hope is a great title for the show, the good news is we have effective treatments, whether it be talk therapy, medication, other treatments as well, so people need to have access to that treatment. Thank you, doctor. Dr. Evans, you are in Boston. Highest priorities there? Well, I think access to treatment is hugely important here in Boston as in the whole country. And we do have effective treatments, as Dr. Bornstein says, but people need uh, often help with connecting with those treatments. And there's a whole array of treatments now effective, medication and talk therapy, but there are many other uh, ways that people can, can help themselves in the mental health crisis that's been sort of born with COVID-19, and that's finding ways, despite the restrictions, to have connection with each other uh, and, and do self-care in addition to treatment. Thank you, Dr. Evans. And Dr. Scott, your thoughts? So I'm, I'm a pediatrician working in, in an underserved area uh, with primarily Black and Hispanic patients who have been disproportionately affected 
by this virus. And I think for me, the most important thing that needs to happen, um, as we mentioned before, is access. But specifically for me, it would be access to telemedicine services for mental health, especially in these communities where access to mental health services is a huge issue. I think um, we also need to provide additional training and support to pediatricians who are often the first contact when it comes to patients dealing with mental health issues. And I can tell you that I've been in practice for over 25 years. And in the last two years, um, I have not seen this level of mental health when it comes to anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, um, you know, then you know, that I have, um, you know, at, at the beginning of my training. So it, it is it is a huge issue. And then lastly, I would say that we need to provide additional resources to our public schools to incorporate school based mental health care. Um, our schools are, you know, um, operating with uh, less resources, but taken on a much greater burden, especially during this pandemic, um, with all of the students suffering from a host of mental health issues. So I think that that needs to be a priority as well. And I'm going to piggyback on what you just said, Dr. Scott, because let me tell you, the numbers are startling. Let me share some of these numbers with our viewers. 50% of mental illnesses begin by age 14, 75% by age 24, and the average delay for first symptoms to getting help is 8 to 10 years. And now, on top of that, let's look at COVID's impact on kids specifically. First, there were learning losses when schools shut down. So what does that mean? Children with special needs were affected social and interactions also affected no after school activities. It just became a snowball effect. And although children weren't hit as hard physically, they suffered emotional losses as well. Take a look at this. Children who are chronically ill, children and teenagers, families are at higher risk for mental illnesses here. Approximately 170,000 lost a parent, a caretaker to COVID-19. Imagine that. And children, of course, as caretakers, over 5 million children are taking care of a family member. There is parental burnout. With all those numbers, Dr. Azaret, I'm going to go to you. It's just startling. It's, um, it's emotionally draining uh, for us professionals that are dealing with these kids and their families and for the families también. And you have to think that during the pandemic, at least in the area that, that I live in Florida, many kids, many children didn't go to school for a year, a year and a half. So we saw there was not um, assessment for kids that may be uh, having problems learning, uh, assessing learning disabilities, given treatment to those kids, kids that, that are diagnosed uh, in the spectrum that need that work, everything was stopped during the pandemic. And then you have going back to school and the anxiety that that represented. And I, and I have to talk a little bit about the, the parents, the burned out, the, the anxiety, the inability because of the huge stress to make sound decisions at home and to help those kids. So it has been, like Dr. Scott mentioned, I have never seen the amount of anxiety, the amount of depression that we're seeing in children. And, and it's overwhelming for parents, for the school system, for the community, and for us, obviously. It is overwhelming. And Dr. Scott, Let's talk about the underserved community because that's what you talked about just a few minutes ago. Uh, the, the losses that children and families have suffered during this pandemic, especially those areas. What can we do to help? Uh, what can we do just to just reach out? Well, I'm, I'm actually going to, you know, go go backwards a little bit. So, you know, as stated before, approximately 170,000 children have lost a parent or primary caregiver to COVID-19. But children um, of racial and ethnic minorities have been hardest hit. So for every white American child um, who's been orphaned during this pandemic, 2.4 black American children have lost a caregiver. And so this pandemic isn't just about the deaths. And when the schools did shut down and we switched to remote learning, 
it was really difficult for many children in the neighborhood where, where I work to succeed academically, even if they had access to a computer or Wi-Fi. Many of their parents are essential workers and did not have the ability to stay home and supervise younger children. So when families with more resources uh, financially could establish learning pods or pandemic pods and curb learning losses during the shutdown, this was not the case for many um, communities of color where the kids were already behind academically and just felt even further behind, um, creating additional, uh, you know, barriers and uh, and stressors for them. And then on top of that, you know, these were kids that were already living in dysfunctional home environments where they had trauma occurring, and this left them without any safety nets. You know, i.e., being in school. So, you know, I started to see a lot of the, the mental health issues um, exacerbated during the pandemic with with my patients. Um, as far as what we can do, um, you know, I think. I think it's really hard. I think we're still figuring this out. And I, you know, there, there really hasn't been a precedent for something like what we're going through right now. You know, I, I know we've heard this over and over again, but it's like we're, we're building the airplane as, as we fly it. So I think, you know, just, I, you know, in general, probably some of the things that we need to do is we need to increase federal funding to ensure that all families can access mental health services. As I mentioned before, we need to improve access to telemedicine, especially in communities of color, and we need to support effective models of school-based school mental health care. Thank you, Dr. Scott. We recently visited a place where they use horses, horses to assist with mental health therapy for children and others who are struggling. Take a look at this. From the moment I arrived, I mean, it's so peaceful and it's so important to have that peace when you're when you're doing therapy, right? Well, it, it makes all the difference, especially for children to arrive here instead of going into an office to arrive here and be surrounded by nature and natural sounds and natural smells and animals. And it relaxes people. They feel safe. They feel like they can open up a little bit. And that's the first step in having a successful conversation. And that's my next question opening that door of communication how important is that it's it's everything but it's very difficult for people especially children unless you've established trust right and if you can establish that from the start before you've even walked in with a horse then it's going to make for a much richer conversation sometimes it's hard for these children to express themselves whether they're nervous to talk to parents adults any things of that sort and Sometimes, you know, they just feel safe with animals and to create that space where they're able to kind of finally let go of some of those things that they're carrying or just say it because there's no wrong answers here. So they can say it in the most goofy way, or straightforward yes. way, whatever, whatever it is. Um, and to actually visu like visually see them come out of that shell is truly the best part of my work here and, uh, you know, just allowing them to that space to, to continue moving forward there. We have a number of exercises that we've developed. We work in teams. We have therapists uh, that have been trained through our program. We have equine specialists who are there to monitor the situation, monitor the horse, the safety, but also to read the body language of what's happening because that's a lot of rich information. For example, the way a client will have a lead rope in their hand is very useful information. Do they have the lead rope holding the horse right by the jaw or do they stand at the end of the lead rope and leave it very slack? There's so much of a conversation in that small, small action that that can be the session right there. For a human to come into a horse's space with all of the anxiety and all of the fear that comes from being with a 1,500 or 1,200 pound animal, establishing a relationship based on trust and boundaries is incredibly rich for the human to experience. Once, the, once a person engages with a horse and feels that trust established and feels that they have a connection, they realize that they have that capacity to do that with other people and mm. they leave here with tools that they didn't have when they arrived. No. It's called the stable place. It says it all in just those two words, stable place. That's what we're looking for. Safety and calm and peace. Everyone deserves that. Oh, I wanna thank them for having me out there. It was such an important hour for me to see and the impact I saw with the children who didn't wanna talk. And after an hour, they started voicing their concerns and opening up. It was just magnificent. Uh, I wanna share a graphic here that details some milestones on the path to mental health recovery and then talk about it with Dr. Evans. Fighting the stigma, access to care, that's a huge challenge. Small changes that make the difference. The role of education and prevention. Dr. Evans, can you address the stigma of mental illness and what that can do? 
Sure. Stigma is enormous. Uh, stigma reduces help, help seeking. And stigma and shame, they turn us in and shut us down just at a time when we need to be able to reach for connection, to reach for help, reach for treatment. There are effective treatments out there, uh, and they're underutilized. Um, so as I mentioned in the beginning, we need to increase access to treatment, but we also need to actively connect people with treatment, which is some of what, what I think Dr. Scott was saying. Um, there's also, I think, in part because of stigma, some of the accommodations that lowered barriers for treatment access are being becoming beginning to be rolled back. Um, uh, these these access to telemedicine, uh, for that to be able to be given across state lines, um, uh, for for doctors to be able to be in a different state to be able to treat people wherever they are and, and have insurance pay for that. Th these are accommodations that lower barriers to care that need to be extended indefinitely. Uh, and and I think to some extent because people uh, and family members of, of people with, with substance use and, and psychiatric uh, uh, disorders aren't able to advocate quite as well for themselves. And I think in part that is in part through because of stigma. And education makes an enormous difference, um, that these are brain diseases and that, that the treatments are helpful. Mm -hmm. I think just just that gives hope that, uh, that could allow people to, to reach for care more. And Dr. Access to Care is such a huge issue, as we have discussed, as you have said. What can really make a difference, Dr. Bornstein? Your thoughts here? I think a few things. First of all, this issue of stigma is a part of the access to care issue because people don't seek the help that they may need because they may be embarrassed or ashamed. So a show like this that really shows people that this is something that people should not be shy about, that people should get help and with help they'll get better makes a big difference. As has been discussed, the, the use of telemedicine is a big plus, especially for younger people. They're used to using their cell phones, computers to communicate, and not having to travel to an office really helps with the access issue. So I think there's a lot of hope with, with that use of telehealth moving forward. We just need to make sure that it's available to the people who need it. Thank you, doctor. And Dr. Scott, talk a little bit about the role of education and prevention. Dr. Evans obviously talked about education, the importance of it and prevention. Yeah, so one of the things that I've actually changed in, in my practice to identify patients who have mental health issues but may not present with those specific complaints is to ask every patient that comes in how they're feeling and how, how they've been coping during the pandemic. And I'm also screening with behavioral health questionnaires at most visits for both anxiety and, depress uh, and depression. So I open up the conversation with letting patients and their families know that the pandemic has taken a toll on everyone in some way, including me, as a physician, you know, even even when the outward signs may not be visible and that it's OK not to be OK and to get help if you need it. And so the same way that you wouldn't hesitate to treat your child's asthma or diabetes, mental health is no different. And sometimes therapy isn't enough, um, as stated before, and medication is required and there shouldn't be any fear or shame in that. Um, as far as the prevention part of it, I think, you know, probably the, um, the biggest things that I, you know, that I've been trying to encourage during the pandemic with my patients is number one, sleep hygiene, which is really critical um, for children and adolescents, you know, setting a realistic bedtime based on age, uh, turning off the electronics 30 minutes before bed and encouraging some type of meditation or just even reading uh, in bed quietly. Um, exercise is another big one because with you know, all of the shutdowns, a lot of these kids, you know, lost their ability, um, you know, to play sports and whatever they, they were involved in um, physical activity wise. And so, you know, even if it's just a uh, jumping rope or riding your bicycle around the block, um, you know, I, I encourage vigorous exercise for at least 30 minutes, three to five times a week. And then lastly, I would say, um, you know, I'm encouraging real time social connections with friends, you know, not just over social media platforms. And I think, um, you know, that part is is incredibly um, you know, necessary and important for, for our adolescents. 
Thank you, Dr. Scott. We have so many questions coming in from the audience, and I want to get to them. Uh, because of privacy concerns, we have chosen not to disclose the name of the viewers or their location, but let's get to a couple of them. Dr. Azaret, I'm going to give this one to you if you don't mind. This viewer writes, any advice for teens dealing with anxiety? Your thoughts there? So many things that can be done. In, like the panel mentioned before, we have treatments. We have excellent treatments in, ter in terms of talk therapy, in terms of medication, in terms of uh, uh, exercises that the kids can do. And, and I think part of the, uh, I want to go back a little bit because I live in a, in a community that is extremely diverse. And, and that is stigma and that sense that mental illness is, is, is not, it's not an illness, that, that you have to be strong, that you have to fight against it. And I think that the message that, that I want to send to all the teenagers, and we're seeing an increase, incredible increase in, in anxiety, that, that there is a way out, that there is some, there are so many tools. And I, just, I always talk about that we have to have a toolbox uh, with different tools tools that are going to help us immediately, and it can be a breathing exercise, tools that may take a little bit more time, and it can be uh, meditation or doing yoga or conscious breathing. We have a toolbox with many, many tools that can help those teenagers, but the families and the teens, they need to recognize what they are feeling. Uh, they need to embrace it in a way. This is what I'm feeling. This is what uh, the symptoms that I'm presenting. And then let's talk about it. And there are ways to address that. And that is a wonderful conversation that many parents can have with their teenagers. And because everyone is anxious nowadays, so we can empathize with each other. And I love what you said, Dr. Azaret. There is a way out. And I want to reiterate that there is always a way out. Thank you for that. I have another viewer question. Uh, Dr. Bornstein, I'd like to see if you can answer this one or at least help us answer it. Uh, this viewer writes, any suggestions of what to tell young children about their parents who committed suicide? That's a tough one, Dr. Bornstein. That's a very, very tough mm -hmm. one. Um, you know, suicide is... The, uh, more people die from suicide than from homicide in our country. Uh, it's an epidemic. And any, anybody who loses someone to suicide, it's a tremendous, tremendous loss. I think that, first of all, if children lose uh, a parent to suicide, they should be receiving professional help so that there's guidance in terms of how to deal with such a tragedy and really process this tragedy. The other thing that I want to say about suicide and suicide prevention is that if you're concerned about a loved one, that they may be at risk of suicide, they're talking about dying, ending their life, you should help them seek treatment. Don't, don't be silent about it. Sometimes people are afraid that if you ask about suicide, you're giving the person the idea. That's not true. Research has shown that asking about suicide, if you're concerned, can save a life. So people should not hesitate to ask that question. Thank you, Dr. Bornstein. I want to turn now to Amy Morin. She is the editor-in-chief of Very Well Mind. She is a podcast host and an international best-selling author. She's had first-hand experience with grief, and she talks briefly about how children grieve. We know kids grieve differently than adults, that adults, we can kind of come to terms. We understand that death is permanent. Depending on the age of the kids, sometimes they struggle with that permanency idea. They still think that somebody could come back next year or maybe next month. So it's important to get them involved in, in groups. There are often grief therapy groups for kids of certain ages where they can connect with other kids and to keep them involved in that over time. Because just because a kid doesn't look like they're sad this week doesn't mean it's not going to hit them differently next week, next month, or five years down the road. So the more that we can do to support kids and let them know that there are healthy ways to express their feelings, that they aren't just going to grieve for a certain amount of time, but instead they're going to grieve over the course of their lives and that that's okay. And the more that we can give them the tools and strategies on dealing with sad feelings and handling them in a healthy way, the better off that they'll be in terms of getting through that. And we're going to hear from Amy in just a little while from uh, for this program. I want to turn to Dr. Scott. Dr. Scott, this is going to have repercussions for decades, isn't it? Yes, it will have um, repercussions for years to come, but 
I still think that we need to remain hopeful. Um, you know, these are uncharted waters for all of us, and we don't have all of the solutions figured out. But we can start putting support systems in place now so that we're in a much better um, place and we're prepared for the next crisis of, of this magnitude. And, you know, and I think that we have to find ways to build resiliency, not only in ourselves, but with our children um, as well in this, in this time of uncertainty. Thank you, Doctor. Another group struggling are those who were on the front lines at the height of the pandemic, and that is healthcare workers. Most healthcare workers are overworked, exhausted, but after seeing so much suffering and death from COVID post traumatic stress, it has become a real issue. Doctor Evans, what advice do you have to help to help healthcare workers cope? I mean, they've seen so much, and in many cases, not only have they seen so much, but they've also lost loved ones themselves. It's tragic. Mm -hmm. It's been such a hard time for everyone and healthcare workers. We need to take our own advice. You know, like all frontline workers, we must practice self care, get exercise, get healthy food, have our social connections in abundance, get sleep, and then to get psychiatric and medical care as needed. And, you know, that has meant uh, taking time and not driving ourselves quite as hard as we as we uh, might be used to, at least uh, as the pandemic in your area wanes a bit, to, to take the time to to look after ourselves. We're sometimes our worst patients, right? That's the uh, that's the um, that's, that's the saying. Um, and I think one of the most important things has been to support each other. So our social connections with our families, with our friends, but our support for each other has been, I think, the lifeline that I've seen uh, active. And so I would encourage people who are feeling burned out to reach for your colleagues because they do know in a way that, that your family and friends may not know firsthand what you've been through. Support each other. That is the lifeline. That is so true, Dr. Evans. Thank you. So how can people recover after the loss of a loved one? We have a short segment from a woman who tragically lost her sister, but found healing and she found peace. Take a look. So my sister died by suicide in May of 2016. But it took me two years to actually be able to say those words out loud. I had to cry through it. I had to go, you know, be angry, be sad, go through all those emotions. It was a journey. You don't just go from point A to point B overnight. I recognized that I couldn't handle it alone, that I needed help. And that's not easy for me to do, to ask for help. And I went through, you know, because of a friend's advice, I went to a therapist and I went pretty regularly for several weeks. And it's, and it's interesting because people might think, well, if I talk to my loved one about it, that's the same thing, I don't need a therapist. But sometimes you need someone that doesn't know you, if that makes any sense. An outsider perspective to tell you what's normal, what's not normal, and, and how to proceed. Well, when my sister died. Um, she was an aspiring children's book author. She had, I mean, I went to her apartment. You couldn't go five inches without finding some little writing about this book. And then a friend of mine said, you should finish your sister's book. And I was like, yeah, okay. And I think I kind of thought like, okay, that's, you know, maybe. And then they kind of held me to it. And some time had passed. Um, and I was prepared to take out those notes again. Um, but it allowed me to, to grieve in a way that I hadn't been able to grieve. And it allowed me to heal. That I was doing something that was her dream, her passion. And I was bringing it to life. You know, bringing life from death. Without a doubt, Finishing my sister's book has been my proudest moment in life. I can't, nothing even compares to that. To, it's one thing to make your dream come true, but to make someone that you love, to make their dream come true, and to see other people react to that, I mean, that's the greatest gift. It's a gift that keeps on giving. And it helped me close one chapter of my life, no pun intended, and open up a new one. 
What a courageous story. What a story, Dr. Bornstein. Uh, I guess what I'd like to know from you, it, it, how important is it that people find a purpose after the, the loss of a loved one? Because she did. Yeah, it, it's so important. And that was such a moving, as you said, such a moving mm -hmm. description by her. The, uh, and, and I think the two take home messages from what she said was, first of all, she sought professional help that you can't go it alone. You need the support of friends and other loved ones. But with such a loss, you need professional help also. That'll make a difference. And then doing something in honor of your loved one. In this example, finishing the book. There are other examples that people have to do in honor of the loved one that they lost. That often helps with the healing as well. And we saw that um, with, with what um, this person explained. And speaking of support, Dr. Bornstein, another group in need of support and hope and help is our veterans. These heroes have given so much to protect us. The issue is very personal to many of us, including TV personality and military veteran Montel Williams. I recently sat down with Montel and asked him about this. Here's what he had to say. I, I hate to say it this way, but you know, we have a lot of people in the country who always go by a veteran and say thank you for your service, turn around and keep walking. They don't wait for an answer or they don't even wait for the veteran to say something back. And because we've been so focused on COVID, we forgot that there are veterans out here that were suffering before COVID right. and now the veteran is suffering because of COVID. Right. Even so, more. And, and I'm not, I don't want to say even more than the average person, but we got to remember they paid a heavy price to get us to where we are today. Right. And we kind of now zoom, like almost let them kind of wallow by themselves. So how would you say they're holding up? You know, I, I hate to paint a picture because that, that, that's a dire, they're, they're in the trenches, but you know, because a lot of veterans will say to me, well, I'll tell you, you know, you got to remember that, you know, about 70% of us are doing really well. We're thriving. But the 30% of us that aren't are doing a little worse than they were doing before COVID. And what we need to do and what we owe them is special attention. I'm sorry, I would say special, but they need it. Absolutely. And there are ways out there right now. I mean, unfortunately, we've gotten so caught up in, you know, the medication route of healing some of the issues that our veterans face when we know that there are other things that are much simpler that they could have access to today. I know you talk to a lot of veterans. You're very passionate about them. Do you have personal stories of those that have been affected before and then COVID and now today are saying, Montel, you know, we need help? I get it more from a thank you. They will come up to me and say, thank you for remembering us. We need more people to remember them. Absolutely, we do. You know, we're at a time where we're at a precipice, at a cusp. These are the guys who have fought left parts behind yes. to allow us to still have the democracy that we have. We owe it to them to do much more than lip service. So no longer just saying, thank you for your service. It's do something about it. We owe it to them. Such a powerful message from Montel. Dr. Azaret, your thoughts on this? I, I just, so moving. Um, and we need to hear that again and again, because it's a population, it, it, when we were talking about population that are, that need our help, that are vulnerable, that, uh, that is a segment of our population that, that we need to understand, that we need to listen to, that we need to, uh, to offer them that help, like Montel mentioned, is not only medication. We need to go beyond that. We need to understand what they are coming from, what they need, and how can we create that community that all of them need so badly. You are so right, doctor. Animal therapy, by the way, has worked for so many, and it is working for veterans as well. We recently visited the Navy SEAL Museum to hear about their companion dog program. Watch this. The Canine Project is a program where we donate working service dogs to our veterans of special operations. The veterans apply for it and then we bring them through a selection process. So there's an interview, there's a home inspection, um, if there's a family involved, there's a family interview as well. Let's go. 
Raptor. This program's different because we're donating working line dogs, and working line dogs are much different than, than pets, so to speak. These dogs are going to force the veterans to get out, get up off the couch, and move. Um, and it gives them purpose. The veterans of special operations have been moving at 1,000 miles an hour throughout their whole career. And that transition into civilian life can be difficult. This dog is going to keep you moving. He's going to, you know, the dog is going to keep you on your toes. The bond between that elite warrior and that and that elite dog um, is very powerful. Want to come up here? Up. Yeah. You like that? Happy? Want to go home? Want to go home now? I received Finn four years ago. It makes life better in the fact that uh, I always have a companion with me for daily. Um, the rites of passage, getting up in the morning, making coffee, going out into the world. See that over there, Finn? Life before the Canine Project, you, know, you had your days. It was, it was rocky and bumpy, and, and you know, I used to be a people person. Finn makes it very easy to interact with people because who doesn't like a dog? You have two souls that are in search of something. And at that moment, when you bring them together, um, it's magical, right? So you have the veteran who's looking for that battle buddy, and you have the dog who's looking for someone to bond with. We have a saying, um, the dogs can see beyond the, f beyond the flesh, right? So human beings could um, have things burning on their heart, and um, we might not see that from the outside, um, but you can't fool the dogs. You could say you're okay but the dogs know that you're not. They have that unique power that, uh, that we don't, and the dogs are always there to, uh, to serve that veteran and be there for them when they're not feeling well. I love this, Dr. Evans. So much of what you said earlier too about support, supporting each other. He said he's my companion. Obviously it's not a person, but it's just as important as a person, isn't it? It absolutely is, and animals can provide that sense of, of, of well-being and, and warmth uh, and being okay in life that can really help soothe anxiety, depressed feelings. So it's important. Story. It's a wonderful story. Uh, got more questions coming in from our audience. And Dr. Bornstein, I'd like to give you this question, uh, if you don't mind. This viewer writes, I'm, a, I'm looking for a neurologist psychiatrist who treats mental illness like bipolar. The psychiatrist who is treating my grandson, the only thing they do is give him so much medication since he was 17 years old. Now he is 21. It is not working. What are your thoughts that that viewer is watching right now? Yeah, I, I fail for you. That's a great question. First of all, if it's not working, just as in the case of a medical situation, get another opinion. So you need to seek help. Often doing so through an academic center, where there might be a variety of resources available, is the best way. And now, as has been pointed out already, with the availability of telehealth, you can live anywhere and still have access to that kind of quality care. So I would say to this person, you're right, don't give up. Get another opinion and continue to work to help your loved one. Bipolar is, a, is an illness that is fully treatable, uh, not only with medication, but with talk therapy and other treatments. So don't, don't give up. Thank you, doctor. I'd like to move on to another crisis that continues to take its toll. That's the number of overdose deaths. Dr. Evans, please tell us what is behind this tragedy. I mean, Olga, there are multiple causes behind the overdose epidemic. We've had lots of discussions about the causes of the opioid epidemic, right? That, that epidemic has been raging really since 2010. And then we had COVID-19. Um, and so COVID, as we all know, increased our isolation from each other, which had a huge effects from our support systems. And people beginning to get into trouble may have gone on unrecognized uh, when their addiction may have been sort of preventable or treated early. And isolation was a trigger often for relapse for people in recovery. I mean, COVID made effective treatment, you know, already 
way underutilized due to real barriers and stigma to be even harder to access for many places. I mean, um, New York City and, and a number of places made uh, sort of uh, agonist treatments uh, able to be delivered uh, to people's homes, you know, lowering the barriers to treatment that were all too much in place in, in other places. Um, and there's stigma to admitting to having an opioid use disorder that we, we of course, need to dismantle. But on top of this, there's a stigma to taking the so-called agonist therapies. Uh, these are called medication-assisted therapy. These are suboxone, methadone, and they are life-saving treatments. I just repeat, they're life-saving treatments. And the more, as a society, we encourage the use of effective medication treatment for opioid use disorder, to speak out for reductions of barriers to treatment, uh, the, the less we'll see this, uh, this uh, overdose epidemic continue. And another thing, we should all carry Narcan. I have two in my purse right now. Uh, it's a medication that's available in many states without a prescription to anybody who requests it. And it's increasingly carried by first responders and people in the community. You can go on YouTube and you can, you can see Narcan being administered and seeing somebody who's, who's dying or, or almost I mean, has, you know, heart has stopped from an overdose. They've stopped breathing to sort of literally come back to life. And so this is the kind of thing that's available and, and, and can be more available. Dr. Evans, can you explain what that is, Narcan, and what it does, please? Narcan actually reverses the activity of an opioid at the receptor. So it outcompetes at the, at the mu opioid receptor uh, the um, opioids that are used, like fentanyl or heroin or Oxycontin. Uh, and so it, it, it basically uh, frees those receptors so that you begin to breathe again. Um, sometimes you need two doses. Um, and so, so giving a dose and watching somebody start to breathe again, it, that's good, but then call 911 and be ready with a second dose because some of these, these uh, opioids that are available are so potent, you need two doses or even more. Thank you for explaining that, Doctor. I appreciate that so much. We know that in 2016, Dr. Azaret, one in five deaths among young adults were opioid related. Today, those numbers have skyrocketed. What can we do to help those who are addicted find help, the help they need? Um, that's the key question is basically, uh, and I always tell parents and my hospital, we're, we don't see the, those type of patients, but we guide them. You know, it's being aware of what what resources we have in the community. And then it's education, education, and education, uh, specifically with high-risk populations and the families. So they need to understand what is going on in our cities, in our streets, and what's happening with the, with the youth. So guiding them, uh, helping them find that help and that prevention work that they need so badly. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Bornstein, I just wanted to ask you, you know, we know there's no magic cure to stop addiction, but there are steps that can be taken to overcome it. Can you briefly share some? Absolutely. The, uh, Dr. Evans referred to some of the medications that are being used, but we know there are effective therapies for chemical dependency, both with one-on-one -on -one therapy, group therapy, and then self-help groups make a very big difference in people's lives. People are able to recover from chemical dependency with appropriate support and treatment. And again, don't give up. Sometimes people may relapse, but they could relapse and still get into recovery again. They need to continue that treatment. Thank you, doctor. I want to get back to some questions that are coming in from viewers. And this one, uh, Dr. Scott, I'm going to give this one to you. How can a parent help children who have been verbally abused by a narcissist parent? Your thoughts? That's a tough one. Um, so I think 
probably, um, and I've, I've stated this before, uh, that you should probably um, go to your child's pediatrician as the first point of contact um, to do some, some sort of assessment and to also provide uh, the resources that you would need within, within the community. Uh, so, you know, I think, I think the pediatrician is really, um, it's somebody that you've established a relationship with and that you can trust. And that should be really the, the, the point person for, um, for anything like, like that. But I think that that's, that's the person that, that I would go to first, um, you know, to uh, do an assessment and then also to, you know, to provide uh, whatever resources are needed. Thank you, Dr. Scott. I want to turn now to telemedicine. It was vital during the pandemic, and what has become very popular is online mental health therapy. Let's listen to Amy Morin from Very Well Mind talk about the effectiveness on online therapy. Take a look. And I was pleasantly surprised that a lot of the concerns I had about online therapy weren't accurate at all, that you could form a relationship with an online therapist, it's a little bit different than if you sat in their office and you met with them in person. But when you do video chats, sometimes it feels almost like you're actually actually there. And for people who aren't comfortable being on camera, you can message a therapist. You don't necessarily have to talk to them face to face at all. So there are a lot of options when it comes to online therapy. And so for a lot of people, it might fit better into their lives that they don't have to commute to the therapist's office. They don't have to schedule a weekly appointment, that they don't have to uh, worry about getting childcare or having the time off from work. Instead, there's so much more flexibility with online therapy that I think for a lot of people that just works better. I'd like to ask all of you about this. Uh, let me start with Dr. Evans uh, in the Boston area. How has it worked with telemedicine? Has it been positive uh, improvements needed possibly? That's a great question. You know, Olga, during COVID, my department of psychiatry in a general hospital did not have a reduction in visits as other specialties did. In fact, we saw with the same uh, workforce with the same number of therapists and, and physicians, we saw more patients and we had a much lower uh, no-show rate, largely because it was easier. People didn't have to drive in, didn't have to park, uh, and could could basically access a, a, a treatment from wherever they were. If their kids were doing homeschooling, as most of ours were, they could still uh, you know, see their doctor. So tele, telemedicine for psychiatry was fantastic and it needs to continue post COVID. Dr. Bornstein in New York, was it successful for you and your staff? It, telemedicine has been very successful here in New York and certainly around the country. Um, in many ways, it's a game changer. You don't have to go all the way to the office, spend the time doing so. It's so much more convenient. And the reality is it's making use of technology. Look, here we are today. We're in different locations, but it's almost as if we're together in the same room or studio. For telepsychiatry, it works extraordinarily well. And we were speaking earlier about the issue of access to care. We we're speaking about stigma. These are ways to get around those issues because you could have the therapy, you could have the treatment in the comfort of your own home. Dr. Scott, would you like to chime in on telemedicine and here in South Miami? Yeah, I 100% agree with all of that. And I had actually implemented telemedicine in my own practice uh, years before the actual pandemic. And so when the pandemic hit and there were a lot of doctor's offices who weren't using telemedicine and when they had to shut down and to get PPE and, you know, and, um, and other uh, safety precautions before opening up, um, it was difficult for them to, to switch over to telemedicine during that time period. And I found just the opposite. My patients had already been uh, very comfortable using telemedicine. And so it was a really seamless transition when we did shut down for a week or two um, at the beginning of, of the pandemic. And then one of the things I've done as well is that as far as trying to create um, more access for my patients when it comes to mental health services, I actually have a partnership with Florida International University and with their um, psychiatry department. And so um, as part of that partnership now, we are doing um, telepsych and I'm able to do referrals, you know, through this program uh, to, to get services for my patients. So yes, I, I, I love telemedicine and um, it, it's really been a great adjunct to, um, to my practice.
Thank you, Dr. Scott. Dr. Azarit, I just got a question from a viewer that I'd like to turn to you. And this viewer writes, has legal marijuana created more psychological cripple takers with no healthy safety net? Your thoughts on that, doctor? That, that, that's a good question and a complex question to ask, especially uh, what, we're seeing, what we're seeing now in my hospital in Miami is the amount of children that are smoking marijuana that is, that is being laced with other ingredients. So the danger is huge. They don't understand. Uh, the families don't understand either. So that is one of the major issues that we need to be dealing with in terms of education and in terms of prevention with kids in elementary school, in middle school. Uh, parents need to get educated. Parents are afraid to ask, to explore, to learn about it. And, it's, and we have a huge need that parents need to be involved in the community in what is happening in terms of addressing those issues with their kids, with their adolescents, and with the community. Dr. Evans, would you like to give your thoughts on this? I would. I, I, the tragedy, I think, is that people are turning to cannabis when they have a psychiatric or substance use disorder in hopes that it will help them. And what I see, first of all, is it's a missed opportunity for proven treatment to be used. Uh, we have treatments that we've been talking about that are proven effective. And cannabis has no proven role right now in the treatment of mental health and substance use disorders. So it's not, you know, so... I would urge people to use proven treatments um, for these problems. Thank you. And Dr. Bornstein? Yeah, I, I think th those points are very important. You know, the, the brain continues to develop um, through the mid-20s. So taking drugs such as marijuana, especially for younger people, can have a negative effect on the brain. And the strength of the marijuana nowadays is, is much stronger than it was in the past. So I would really urge people to be very cautious about it. And I think the legalization sort of to some people may give a green light to do something that really isn't safe for them to be doing. Thank you, doctor. This has been such a fantastic discussion. We're almost out of time. I do, before we end this hour, want all of you to tell me what you believe we need to be doing to help people find hope and healing. What steps we can take to help ourselves cope with all of this. Dr. Evans, I'm going to start with you. I think it's the same uh, as I said for the healthcare workers. You know, do your self care, exercise, good food, social connection with people, with pets. Uh, seek your medical and psychiatric treatment. Find each other online if you have to. Um, but these, these, these self-care um, and connection approaches, I think, can help us get through this. So important. Uh, Dr. Borenstein, some words, if you don't mind. We have about four minutes left, so we do have some time. Yes. You know, I'll go back to the early statistics about the these illnesses such as anxiety, depression, other illnesses, beginning in youth, um, beginning in, in the teenage years, uh, going into the early 20s. That, and that so many people don't get treatment for an extended amount of time. We need to change that so that people get treatment right away. If you're having chest pain, if you have a broken leg, you're not gonna wait eight to 10 years to get treatment. You're gonna get treatment right away. We need to change our culture a program like this is doing that. I'm very hopeful mm -hmm. about the future because people are learning that we do have effective treatments that make a big difference and people know that we need to know that with help, there is hope. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Scott. So um, I'm a big believer in finding gratitude in our daily lives, you know, even in the midst of this pandemic, when, you know, every everyone is just, you know, just tired <laughs> of you know of this this uh this two-year toll that you know that we've been dealing with but um you know part of what i do is i um i give back I've, I've always done that my entire life 
And it really became my therapy during the pandemic. So just doing random acts of kindness brought me so much joy and purpose. And I think that we all have to find something similar to write out this, this new norm that we're living in. And you know, we, we just have to remember that this is a marathon and it's not a sprint, but we will get through this, um, you know, just working together. And I think we really have to be um, our brother's keeper. You know, you see something, say something. Thank you so much, Dr. Azarit. And I'm going to continue the, 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 the sense of working together. And let me tell you very briefly something that we're doing and um, that it has been incredibly gratifying. Uh, in our hospital, we decided to create a network in, in our community, different agencies, all kinds of agencies, big brothers, big sister, parent to parent, different agencies. And that network has grown in a way that we are able to, to refer patients that need uh, that, uh, that access to mental health. So I think the message is less it, we hear all the time that it takes a village to to grow a child. Let's support that village. The, let's look for those uh, um, institutions, for those uh, groups that are that are right there in the community, and let's create that network that is going to bring not only help but hope for tomorrow. Thank you so much. I'm always writing sound bites, and I have a few here. There is a way out. Uh, support each other. It is the lifeline. This is a marathon, not a sprint. These are words that all of you said. I want to thank you so much for your time, all of you for what you've done in the last two years and what for you continue to do for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. God Thank bless you, you all. And we hope we were able to provide some valuable informa information and more importantly, offer help and hope. I do want to show you a few numbers that I think is very important. Uh, this is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. It's open 24 hours a day, 1-800-273-8255. We have another one, the Addiction Substance Abuse, 1-800-662-4357. And finally, this one, which is the Veterans Crisis Line. Thank Thank you so much for your time. We hope you found hope. We will get through this. I'm Olga Villaverde, and we'll see you next time. Have a nice evening. Thank you to the Eunice Joyce Gardner Charitable Foundation for its leadership support of the Health Channel. Living Minute, a look at the latest medical innovations changing our lives. Brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific's Coronavirus Testing Program for Schools. The COVID-19 virus has had a profound impact on nearly every facet of society. And while children have been spared much of the most devastating physical effects, it's taken an emotional toll, especially those kids who lost a parent. Over 140,000 children in the United States have lost at least one parent to COVID. Not having a parent, you know, for the rest of your life is a really significant adverse event. And, and that's why, you know, it is very much a disease that's affecting children in multiple different ways. The kids aren't the only ones. A new survey finds nearly nine out of 10 parents say the pandemic has left them feeling overwhelmed and struggling to cope. This Living Minute is brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific's Coronavirus Testing Program for Schools and the Health Channel. South Florida PBS's Health Channel has your health at heart. That's why we're bringing you a new subscription plan that allows you to access great services to take better care of your health and to help you control the cost of health care. All HealthGo gives you access to unlimited telehealth doctor consultations 
directly from your mobile device and at no additional cost. In addition, you can also reach emotional counselors if you ever need to. The subscription plan also gives you access to your own patient advocate who can help you navigate the complexities of the healthcare system and a great number of tools that help you negotiate medical bills, locate services in your area at the right price, and secure great discounts. Subscribe now for as little as 55 cents a day and start enjoying this great service. Visit gocare.tv.